Hi. Over a third of the world's population still rely on traditional fuels such as wood and charcoal for cooking. However, these solid fuels release an estimated gigaton of CO2 every year, as much as the global aviation industry, and account for around 2% of the world's CO2. They are also a huge health risk, leading to more than 3 million deaths each year, with women and children affected the worst. Here at Loughborough University, researchers are trying to find ways to transition to clean energy cooking. With me are Professor Ed Brown, Dr Richard Blanchard and Dr Jerome ching Army, who are leading the way in this field. Richard, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you do. Yeah, so I'm uh, Richard Blanchard and I'm a reader in renewable energy at Loughborough University. Uh, I also have a role as the Head of Energy and Power Engineering Research at CREST, which is the Centre for Renewable Energy Systems Technology. And for the past 30 years we've been involved in developing uh, technologies, modelling um, energy systems to try to sort of reduce our uh, reliance on uh, fossil fuels and, uh, and try to find sort of you know, technical and uh, solutions and economic solutions uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, wean us off, uh, off of fossil fuels. Um, within the sort of a context of, of clean cooking, um, as part of the, the MEX programme, um, we were involved in trying to develop um, technical systems um, because it's very uh, challenging to try to sort of uh, uh, find alternatives to traditional forms of cooking uh, which could be affordable and, uh, and reliable. Excellent. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what, what those energy forms are in the traditional cooking. But first, Ed, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, yeah, um, I'm Ed Brown. I'm Professor of Global Energy Challenges uh, here at Loughborough University, uh, which is part of the Geography Division of the School of Social Sciences and Humanities. Um, I'm also one of the three co-directors of the STEER Centre. Um, STEER stands for Sustainable Transitions, Energy, Environment, Resilience. Uh, and for these purposes, I'm the overall lead, together with my colleague Simon Batchelor, on the Modern Energy Cooking Services Programme, which is a UK government FCDO funded programme uh, that has been going for the last five years or so, precisely looking at these kinds of issues and uh, um, developing uh, new ways of tackling that issue. Uh, I'm also involved in another UK aid funded programme called uh, Climate Compatible Growth, which is led by my colleague uh, Professor Mark Howells here at Loughborough as well. Wonderful. And Jerome? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Jerome Nsengaremye. Uh, I'm a research associate for MEX. Uh, actually, I work with Ed. So uh, uh, I mostly do the quantitative analysis uh, of the data actually collected uh, uh, across countries we work with and uh, also with partners. Right, OK. So first off, I think it's important to spell out what clean cooking is, clean fuels and clean technology. So we'll start with Richard. Um, can you give us an example of what is clean cooking? Uh, clean cooking, um, we're trying to basically get, move away from um, solid fuels which are, you know, produce smoke particulates and also contribute to the, the carbon emissions. So we're really looking at things which are uh, electricity based and also gas based. So they actually burn uh, clean for the actual people who are actually, you know, in case of gas, who are actually doing the cooking so they don't get exposed to smoke uh, particulates. And also electric cooking is, is um, yeah, in the home will be uh, emission free. You could also add ethanol to that list. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And so th there's the, there is the health aspects and there's also environmental aspects as well. Um, is there anything else? Cost maybe? Or? Yep. Yeah, Ed? definitely. Yeah. Ed or Joe? Go on, you go for it, Joe. Yeah, yeah uh, actually in terms of costs, uh, I think polluting fuels, even though they've been you know, used for a long time, but uh, when you look at the evidence uh, from research that we've been doing and uh, the data analyzed, actually across all those countries in Africa and in Asia, you could see that uh, with uh, new technologies or solutions uh, uh, in electric cooking, uh, for example, you can see uh, when you cook with an EPC, electric, pr electric pressure cooker, you actually you use only one third of the uh, of the cost of fuel that you'd use uh, that you'd actually spend when cooking with LPG. Uh, and that's, that's gas. Yeah. Yeah. And the savings actually huge and more when uh, you transition from charcoal or firewood to. Okay. Uh, and is that would that be the same for, for for the rest of the world as well? Yeah, that's so actually it's a saving anywhere. for yeah. typical meals oh, that okay. are cooking, cooked across those countries. There's, there's one caveat we do need to add, add to that, which is 
Um, it does differ in different countries according to a whole host of, di of yeah. different factors. So, um, for example, there are quite a lot of parts of, of Africa where people gather fuel, they don't pay for it. Okay. So, in that, so in that case, you know, to say it's cheaper, is, is, it clearly isn't. Yeah. But so you have all sorts of issues that come into play there. But where people are paying for fuel, then cooking with electricity is becoming, um, firstly, close in price, and then in many, many cases, actually significantly cheaper. Um, and it all depends on what governments are spending to subsidise the alternative fuels um, uh, and what legislation is in place in terms of, of, of putting higher costs on using the polluting fuels. You know, that's a principle that is becoming more and more as people recognise the damage that, that, yeah. that is being caused to our environment from continuing to utilise those fuels. So um, I think it's funny, when you first start thinking about cooking, you kind of think, oh, it must be a relatively straightforward thing. But actually, you know, you, 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 you start looking at all of the issues involved. There's uh, questions of affordability that we've just been talking about, questions about government policy and subsidisation and, and strategy and so on. There's then also uh, the technologies involved in developing new ways of producing fuels, new types of stoves, um, all of those kinds of factors. And then there's a whole host of issues about how do you finance programmes to spread these new technologies. And then finally, cooking is a highly personal thing. You know, we all have the things that we like to cook. We have the ways that we like to cook them. And um, that also is a challenge in terms of how you address the ways in which people cook and how those, way, those forms of cooking are, are being transformed over time. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's highly complex. Yeah, well, I think I would just point out, picking up what Jerome was saying about the cost, is also the, there's, there's an avoided cost as well, that actually you know, you've got the time being saved when you're not actually having to go and collect the firewood, the time you spend having to be in front of the fire, maintaining the fire, so you have all these sort of avoided costs. And then you, and from a health perspective as well, you know, people's well-being, uh, you know, we, we, you mentioned three million deaths yeah. per year, and there's, well, there'll be many more people who'll be uh, incapacitated um, with illnesses as well, uh, caused by smoke. So you have a sort of a medical cost which will be avoided by using clean cooking. I know it's not a direct thing, but those sort of indirect things do need to be factored in. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also that illustrates, even that point illustrates the complexity, because I think as, as Richard said earlier on, um, there is a, a complexity to who is most affected by those health impacts, and by and large it's women and children. Yeah. So you then have that issue in terms of how do you address policies that, that, that look at that particular issue. And to some degree, I think the reason why clean cooking has been um, deprioritized or hasn't been given a significant amount of priority over the years is because it's seen as a women's issue. Yeah, I um, agree. And people that are watching this carefully might notice actually that um, uh, there are well, four, four, blokes, four blokes here yeah. talking about cooking. Just to yeah. say, I mean, one is, I think you're going to illustrate this with some of the videos of yeah. the people that we work with. So um, we, as a team actually, in terms of, of the MEX team, we have a, a large number of women researchers uh, across the, the, the programme. It just happens to be that for the, 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 this particular session, these are the people that were available to come and speak. But um, absolutely, this is an issue that has a massively important gendered component yeah. to it. Um, and it's really important to, to recognise that and to make sure that everything that we do has that kind of centre stage. Is it becoming more and more of a priority? So Mex has been working on this for the, for, for the last five years. And actually, those of us in, involved in setting it up were working on it for considerably longer than that. And I think we were hit by um, the fact that, A, no one was really looking at this issue. It was seen very much as a niche. There was like a clean cooking industry that had built up around some, some solutions that had been offered, but these solutions were not really making any inroads or significant inroads into the numbers of people that were still facing these, uh, the challenges of cooking with, with polluting fuels. So we wanted to look for an, an alternative way of thinking about it and therefore some alternative solutions. Um, so over the course of the last five years, and I'm not making any claims that we, we're, we're the only ones that have produced this, this change, I hope we have had a significant impact on it, but it is now rising up the, 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 um, the, the uh, set of important issues that the globe is dealing with. For example, I think we're going to talk a bit later about COP uh, coming up later on this year, and we've managed to get clean cooking into the really high levels of, of, of attention of, of, of um, the, the, the global um, community. So I think in that sense, we've moved from a 
situation where five years ago wasn't receiving a lot of international attention. If you looked at the SDG targets related to energy access, then uh, 7.1.2, which is the access to bringing uh, access to modern cooking to everybody globally, was the SDG that was furthest behind in terms of its progress. It's still a long way behind where it should be, uh, especially in comparison to 7.1.1, which is electricity access. Um, so uh, uh, there's a lot, massive amount to be done. But I think the direction of change is, is, is in the right direction now. And actually, one of the ways of, of, of tackling that is actually utilizing the progress that's been made in electrification access to open up the doors to electricity to be seen as one of the most important ways in which we can address the clean cooking challenge. Yeah, And it's noticeable the number of you know, private sector companies which are now you know, coming out as well who are getting more interested in this, this area as well across Asia and Africa. So there's a much more, um, you know, people are seeing all those tangible solutions here and potential for uh, companies to actually uh, run businesses, make profits uh, uh, from this uh, area yeah. as well. Jerome, you? you mentioned before when we were talking about um, Rwanda and you mentioned about the, the 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 rise in the availability of electricity from it was like a six hundred percent rise or a, a huge rise, wasn't it? Yeah. So can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I think uh, as Ed was saying, uh, countries or governments uh, all over the world uh, have been uh, active in increasing access to electricity. So Rwanda uh, also. Uh, has been on that trajectory. And uh, I think it's uh, really amazing to see that uh, in 2008, access to electricity was only 6%. And now it's more than 60%. So which is actually a very uh, significant uh, increase or uh, uh, develop, uh, in terms of development. And uh, when you look at that, that actually has effect on uh, uh, like the knowledge of the society. For example, once you have access to electricity, you can also have access to information. And uh, that brings also this uh, issue of uh, cooking where actually people start to know that there are other choice, uh, other uh, alternatives to cooking. Uh, uh, than actually uh, solid bio, uh, solid fuels. Can I add to that? So, um, so actually over the course of the last 10, 15 years, um, Asia has been going through that transition. So you've seen significant um, improvements in electricity access. Um, and we're now reaching the point where um, this is beginning to happen in a number of African countries. Rwanda was mentioned there. It's the same in Kenya, where access has gone up to like 78%. Ghana is another country where there is significant access. Uh, and a, a number of others are beginning to, to follow suit. Um, of course, though, there are many other countries where the numbers remain not quite as low as they were in Rwanda at the beginning of the story that Jerome told, but still it's, it's challenging, um, which means that there are different pathways for different countries that are at different stages in that, in that transition. And it's really important for a programme like ours to work with governments um, and agencies and NGOs and all of these organisations to help those countries um, to realise their, their ambitions in this, in, in this area. And they come from these very different states. I presume it's not as simple as just going to Rwanda and saying, look, what did you do? Can we copy that? Yeah, yeah, precisely. precisely. So um, what, what does have to happen then? Is there, um, is there a, a basic model that, that governments can follow or that countries can follow to? We uh, in the MEX programme have been supporting a number of governments in developing national strategies. And that's evolving out of work that we've been doing in a number of those countries for a good number of years now. So uh, I'll take the example of Kenya. So in Kenya, it's probably the country where we've had the most activity. And so we uh, responded to a request for assistance from the Kenyan government a couple of years ago uh, under the Rapid Response Fund that was part of the UK government's commitments under the COP that was held here in the UK. Um, and one of their requests was to, for assistance in developing a, a national clean cooking strategy and also the first ever electric cooking strategy anywhere in, in, in Africa. And so as part of that, that process, we've been um, building uh, um, the, these, these strategies, which have been around very wide-scale consultation with stakeholders. But we've also been working very specifically with a number of different organisations. So for one, um, we've worked very closely to build the, um, the interest in this issue in the electricity utility. Because sometimes you, you'll go into a country and the utility perhaps traditionally hasn't been very strongly 
um, supportive of the idea of electric cooking because of the potential implications on the load. Oh, okay. uh, so yeah, if yeah. you're a, a utility that has limited supply and very high demand, then anything that increases that demand is going to be problematic. However, as we've seen countries that have expanded their generation and their distribution capacity, then actually utilities are now facing the opposite problem. So in countries like Kenya, there is excess, uh, excess, they're, they're, they are producing more than is being consumed. Um, and so uh, quite often, because of the price of electricity, people are not consuming as much when they get access to the grid as was assumed. So you actually have electricity being produced, for example, through geothermal in Kenya, which is just being steamed away in the, in, uh, in the night time when the demand is, is, is really low, um, for example. So one of the things we've been doing in those contexts is saying, actually, demand for um, uh, electricity for cooking can actually be a way of, of increasing the amount utilised by each consumer, each household and so on, which addresses the need for the utilities to be getting sufficient demand that will meet the investment that they put into the system to meet the demand of the, of, of the population. So in that sense, it becomes something where you can convince utilities to work with us in developing that demand, in developing maybe reducing tariffs to increase more consumption and so on and so forth. So it's, it becomes not just a matter of running programs with NGOs in, in local communities, but it comes part of working with really large organisations, so, which is something that didn't happen in clean cooking before. So it's a very different strategy where we're engaging with ministries of energy, with utilities, with large companies that serve these markets in terms of the, the, the production of electric cooking devices. Yeah, so it's... Is it, and is, it, is it difficult to, I mean, you, you're basically trying to change the course of an entire country from doing one thing to another. Is it, is it difficult to do that? What, what kind of things are you up against? Um, governmentally and yeah I mean it had to be all sorts of challenges because again you're bringing in something which is you know new and in some cases you know as, as Ed was saying only a few years ago wasn't even being, being considered and even a lot of UN agencies don't really sort of hadn't really still don't really think about it so it's actually trying to bring in something which rocks the status quo the way of, of doing things starts to impact on sort of the existing um, systems and the sort of the, uh, the existing power structures as well so you, if you're going to say well you know, if we want to introduce electric cooking, how is that going to affect the people who want to have gas cooking? So you've got to sort of always sort of uh, um, be a potential for conflicts and trying to then sort of convince people of the value of this uh, and to uh, and uh, to try to avoid um, you know coming in as sort of you know externals and, and and then working very closely with with un un country partners. And so it's a long dialogue. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's, a, mm -hmm. that's a sort of a, a key thing. It's not something which can happen overnight because it, it's something which is a, uh, a, you know, we see in other policies in, around the world that you know, things take time to, you know, the, the struggle we have with, with climate policies and things and the, the, the time it's taken, it, it, it takes time. But if you don't do anything about it, nothing will change and people will still die and you know, people will be impoverished because they can't get out of the poverty trap of, of having to collect fuel would. So, you know, so this is why the MEX programme and other programmes are so important to take this on board uh, and, and to try and drive the narrative uh, and change the narrative and the way of doing things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I know that um, part of your work involves um, the energy resilience, yes. which is a big issue in, in places like Africa and, and Asia. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, what I mean, for, for, there's, there's a lot of, whole load of different aspects you can you can tackle energy resilience. There's some of the work we've been steer, we're looking at community energy resilience and how communities are responding to the challenges of energy access. The work I'm involved in is actually more, more looking at the systems, so the electrical electrical infrastructure, and, and how that is resilient to uh, uh, to increases in demands on the load, uh, the effects of climate change. Um, we've seen things, for example, in the UK recently with with a last storm where. Uh, we have you know, the power going off for thousands of people. That means the system's not resilient to that. And we see this in Africa as well. Uh, for example, some work we're doing in Malawi, where recent storms have had significant impacts on the, uh, on the electrical infrastructure. Um, floods and, and storms are responsible for the majority of, of uh, impacts on electrical infrastructure. And you have issues where, again, the issue about you know, the electric utilities are barely, in some cases, barely struggling to maintain their systems. They're using materials which we wouldn't necessarily use in this country, so their things are not being maintained. So we're looking at ways in which um, you know, you're developing uh, policy 
um, systems which we can then present to, to governments today. Well, actually, if you want to think about uh, developing your, your electrical infrastructure, these are a number of things you need to think about, both technically, but also things around skills and training as well, to make sure you've got enough skilled uh, technicians to, to maintain systems and to get systems back up in as short as possible as time. So, for example, having uh, building a thing called redundancy into the system so that you don't just have one power line between two cities, there'll be a second power line so that one may be protected uh, from a storm event. So, And we're looking at sort of long-term climate change issues as well. And some countries have a reliance maybe on one or two forms of electricity. So, for example, Uganda is highly reliant on hydropower. And so, you know, if the climate is changing, you know, how is it going to make, meet its electricity demands now and into the future um, if the climate models sort of are showing that there may be, in some cases, the drying up of, of Lake Victoria and in other cases, excess amounts of water which could, which could actually damage your, your um, hydropower infrastructure. So how do you actually, um, you know, and so, you know, again, trying to learn about those sort of uh, uh, issues. Yeah. Yeah. And Jerome, correct me if I'm wrong, but you work on the environmental impacts as well. Don't you? So things like defo the things that Richard was talking about, things like deforestation and um, impacts on on water. Is is there any? Could you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, uh, actually, the if uh, the impact on the environment can be seen, uh, for example, in terms of uh, uh, cooking uh, fuels, can be uh, seen on uh, actually. Uh, the solid fuel used to cook. For example, let's talk about charcoal. To have charcoal, you have to cut trees, burn them, and all this process actually uh, has effect on the environment. So there is this uh, carbon uh, emissions, uh, but also at the same time, when you cut a tree, actually you remove that uh, tree that could actually uh, absorb the CO2 that's uh, being uh, emitted. So, and also when it comes to collecting, uh, let's say firewood, even uh, cooking with firewood. So you, you need to cut those trees. And uh, you could see that that will have impact not only uh, on the environment, but also on the soil. So uh, you can see erosions that can be uh, easily happening in those areas, uh, but also we have the issues with uh, like water bodies that will be uh, actually polluted by substances that would be trapped by those uh, trees, let's say, on, on the mountains and so on. Yeah. Let's, let's um, turn our attention now to COP because we mentioned that before. So, Ed, you're at COP this year, 28, um, to launch Gecko. Can you explain what Gecko is, please? Yes. So, what we've talked about so far, we, uh, we're a 40 million programme from the UK government, um, run out of, of uh, Loughborough, uh, collaborating with the World Bank, collaborating with projects in, I think we've had a, a, a presence in like 18 different countries over the course of those five years. But ultimately, we're a research programme. So we do research that provides evidence to governments, international organisations, and so on and so forth. We've done some work where we've supported individual companies to develop new products and so on. But ultimately, a research programme is not going on its own to be able to transform the world to the degree that we need to if we're going to address the challenges we've been discussing for the last half an hour. So um, back in June, we hosted a meeting that brought together a wide range of organisations that were committed to seeing electricity particularly um, as the new entrant into this, into this area. So it's something that, that hasn't been central to the attempts to tackle clean cooking uh, globally until the last few years. And even at the moment, it's still, it's still kind of the new kid on the block, as it, as it were. So we brought together a range of organisations that could draw on the research that we've been leading and utilise it to open up financing, to run programmes, to convince more people to get involved, to encourage governments uh, to, to adopt the kind of strategies that can, that can achieve this. Um, so we've developed this new coalition, it's the Global Electric Cooking Coalition. We're going to involve a, a tremendous number of different partners, but it's anchored in four organisations. So we're like the knowledge partner in the coalition, MEX, um, based here at Loughborough. 
Um, there is then uh, the UN Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which is working on both electricity and clean cooking. It's the, uh, the UN organisation that's responsible for tackling the, the SDG 7 around energy. Uh, we're also partnering with GAP, which is uh, uh, the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. And that's uh, a large organisation that, 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 that mobilises capital to deal with the challenges of energy access. It's funded initially via uh, Bezos, um, Ikea and Rockefeller. So that's where there is kind of like that foundational um, resources that's going into that organisation. And then finally, it's an organisation called Endev, which is... Um, uh, organ which, which is um, uh, run by GIZ um, and RVO, which are the German and Dutch equivalents of our FCDO. Um, and their um, track record is in supporting governments to deliver programs in relation to energy access, be it cooking or, or electricity access. And for instance, they've recently announced a new program called GECA, which is uh, 10 million uh, um, pounds worth of dollar, dollars, pounds, can't remember, uh, of, of funding um, to deliver electric cooking specifically uh, in a number of different countries. And they're looking to, to, to increase that to 50 million over the course of the, uh, of the next two or three years. So bringing together that coalition of organisations means we're now in a position to draw in lots of other uh, um, stakeholders, to integrate all of the efforts to encourage uh, countries and organisations to adopt electric cooking, to fund electric cooking um, programmes and so on. And so at COP, we are launching this global coalition that brings together those anchor partners, but with a whole host of other organisations, World Bank, uh, um, the World Food Programme, as we've been mentioning, various parts of the UN, uh, also several of the major companies that are, that are producing the, the appliances and so on. Um, so it will be a call for action at COP. It will be announcing several deals, which we can't announce yet because they're going to be announced there, a funding going into the sector in order to achieve that. So we are enormously excited about this. I think, as I said, when we started, we've, we've never had a presence at this level within the, the, the UN system. And I think the, the final thing I would say is that what we're particularly excited by is that we're launching this at COP. So we uh, were talking about this in the SDG Summit in New York a couple of, uh, of mon months ago, um, which is all to do with energy access. But the exciting thing here is that it's showing the connection between the 2030 SDG targets for bringing energy access to those that don't have it, with the 2050 net zero commitments. So I think that's the other thing is this supports the roadmap for clean cooking that was established by UN DESA, which is the UN Department for Economic and Social Affairs, the World Health Organization and the World Bank, which outlined a strategy for achieving both these 2030 and 2050 targets together over the, over the coming years. And we see ourselves as being an absolutely central part to that strategy. Yeah. You mentioned the 2030 target. What Can you explain what that is? The 2030 target uh, under the SDGs, so there are a whole series of, 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 of different SDG targets that to achieve the transformation of the globe in a sustainable direction by 2030, SDG 7 is to, to, um, to, to uh, uh, simplify. It's about bringing electricity access to everyone globally. It's about bringing access to clean cooking fuels. It's about significantly increasing the amount of renewables that are utilised globally, so the proportion of, of, of energy that is produced from renewables, and significantly enhancing energy efficiency. So under SDG 7, it's those four components. So we're most strongly connected with SDG 7.1.2, as I said before. But one of the, the, the novelties, I suppose, of what we're doing is saying, actually, let's connect the energy, the electricity access and the, and the cooking access together so that we're using investment into electricity access to achieve the, the clean cooking targets at the same time. Yeah. Um, is, is it an ambitious target um, to have the whole world um, hooked up to electricity by 2030? What, what would you say to that? It's an ambitious target, yes. Yeah. Yes, and it's, and, it's, yeah, and it's probably fair to say that it's not necessarily going to be met because of the, the uh, um, yeah, we still have um, yeah, over half a billion people don't have access to electricity, or you know, again, depending on which which figures you you see. And even when there is access to electricity, there's still issues around some issues of affordability. But again, I was saying earlier, if, you know, and, and the clean cooking, you know, 2.6 billion people, something like that. Yeah. Um, but if we don't do anything about it, nothing's going to change. So this is why 
the MEX program and the Gecko program uh, and you know, getting that high profile, you know, which wasn't there five years ago. Um, you know, this uprise is so important. Mm. You know, if we don't, uh, you know, and yeah, in in Africa there are also like they've got 2063 targets as, uh, as well to try to bring about their sort of levels for uh, sustainability because it's a bit further behind um, um, the sort of the, the curve on things. Uh, but it, you know, if we aren't going to be serious about that, we're never going to get anywhere. And the and the issue we were saying earlier about sort of uh, energy poverty, health issues, uh, the burden which falls on women and children uh, just isn't going to go away. And the population is still increasing. So we have to sort of, you know, not just meet the needs of people today. We've got to think about the people who haven't been born yet, who will be around in 2030, 2050, uh, and going further into the future to make sure that they have, you know, um, productive lives. Where they're not, um, you know, ending up in poverty and drudgery, um, and so that they do have, you know, um, you know equity and, and equitability in terms of, the, of of energy provision, which in the West we've been fortunate to have for the last, you know, 80 years or so. Um, so, yeah, and if we don't, you know, do this, it's a real crying shame. Yeah, with um, going back to energy provision. So, how how does that look for um, for the future? I know that you do a lot of work with with hydrogen, so hydrogen energy um, yeah. could be a way forward. Um, how likely is that to, to sort of take a, take a hold? It's, there's a lot of money going into it. I mean, and, 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 and there's, there's a huge amounts of, of, of in, you know, money being claimed and, and pushed towards it. Whether it will be delivered um, you know, is, is another thing. But again, um, you know, we're looking at hydrogen, um, you know, it, it seems to be sort of quite challenging um, in terms of uh, what, how we're going to map it out for the UK um, uh, and what we're going to be doing uh, in, in sort of the context of the UK. Should, you know, do people want to have hydrogen piped into their homes and, and uh, what's the best way to, to produce hydrogen? At the moment, there is a lot of hydrogen produced. 95 to 99% of it comes from methane and, and it's energy intensive and produces carbon dioxide. Um, there's small amounts in, uh, of, of renewable um, green hydrogen being produced um, from, uh, from the electrolysis of water and that is something which um, is, is really the direction of travel we need to go. We need to sort of be weaning off uh, the use of, of gas uh, for this. And in the context of Africa, it, it's something you could almost in, in imagine be sort of almost like a leapfrogging of technology that um, all you need, let's put it simply, uh, is electricity and water. And Africa has got huge potential for renewable resources in terms of the amount of solar energy which Africa uh, receives um, yeah, and availability of hydroelectric power, geothermal energy as well into small, small amounts, even, uh, even some areas which have some wind energy resources. So there's huge potential uh, in Africa for, uh, for electricity generation from renewables, some of which could go towards hydrogen and some of that hydrogen could be then used uh, for electricity purposes, or it could also be used for cooking purposes as well. So there, so there is potential there. Yeah. It is emerging. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, some of the work we're doing, we're doing a lot of work on modelling systems. So we've produced research on what the uh, potential for hydrogen could be from Africa. Africa is a very big continent. We tend, you know, the way maps are drawn, we don't tend to think that. But how do we transport um, hydrogen around Africa? Should we transport hydrogen, or is it better sending it as uh, you know, generating electricity and using the electricity as well, because we could actually use hydrogen to you know, generate electricity for electric cooking, or we could use hydrogen um, for, for gas cooking. So there, are, so there are different aspects which, which we can use there. But there are challenges, and water is a challenge, because we need water for crops, we need water for, uh, for wildlife, we need water for people. So we have to make sure that there are adequate resources available now, but also in the future when the climate might have changed. So we need to map those resources out very carefully so we don't end up creating additional problems, which is something we, we're very good at doing. I, th I think that also speaks to, um, I mean, the hydrogen discussion connects into a wider discussion about energy storage. Um, and uh, here at Loughborough, we hosted, um, I think the first time it was ever held in the UK, the World Bank's Energy Storage Partnership meeting a few months ago, um, which was a great opportunity. And it, and it brought together a lot of the most recent research on um, actually one thing is moving towards having a, a much greener renewables based electricity generation system. The other of which is actually uh, being able to use that to, to, to produce a, a reliable 
um, distribution system where everyone gets access to the electricity when they need it, which means actually that the ability to store the electricity that's generated either from hydrogen or from actually uh, your long list of renewables, you mentioned solar, which I thought was quite I, I, did, I, did, I did say solar, I did say solar, yeah. 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 But I think solar is, yeah. is the, the cheapest um, um, form of, 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 um, of renewables. Um, particularly in the African context, and the, the price at the point that we can get down to, according to some of the really large initiatives that are happening at the moment in a couple of places in Africa, is, is unbelievably low. So if you can couple that with increasing the, uh, the, the increasingly affordable energy storage, then you're in a position to, to be able to demonstrate that actually renewables-based electrification is, is the route that the whole world has to go down. Um, and that Africa could be in a position to lead that, uh, which is really what GAP are, are all about, is kind of investing in these energy storage facilities and so on. And energy storage is important in a whole number of different ways. Um, so it's, it's important in the long-term storage, if there, if there is, for, for example, the need to store uh, um, electricity um, over longer periods that can adjust between um, different periods of, for example, if there's suddenly you, you're struck without wind for about a week or something like that, the ability to do that is really important. Um, it's also though short-term storage, where you can, which you can help you to, inter, in, in, inter, to develop much more sensitive approaches to managing a system, which means that you can introduce all sorts of different tariffs and levels that can, people can be paid to provide storage and so on. So there's a, it's a whole, it's really interesting how all of that works. And I think you can also begin to apply that in terms of the lessons you can draw from that electrification and, uh, and electricity infrastructure into the, the, the clean cooking side. So, for example, if we're talking about people's lack of ability to, to pay for um, electric cooking in some, in some context, then can we work with governments to decrease the, the tariffs specifically for cooking, the technological developments that allow us to track that? And that connects us into some of the most recent technological developments, which is where the, um, uh, the electricity, electric cooking appliances that are currently being developed by some of the companies that we work with um, are uh, connected into the, the, um, the digital world, yeah? so they're ICT connected, which means that they can keep track of the exact amount that they're being utilised. And that is a massively important opportunity for carbon fibres. Because in the past, a lot of the clean cooking sector has relied on carbon finance for biomass um, projects. So where they are getting access to carbon credits on the basis of the, the improved biomass cookstoves mean that you're using less biomass than if you were just using a three-stone fire. Um, and so a lot of the, the industries to develop those cookstoves have been based around the payments that you get from carbon credits on that, on that basis. Recent years, there's been an increasing amount of scepticism about the calculations that are used and the uh, observations of how much they're being utilised. So there are question marks around it to the extent that money is being pulled out of those sectors now. One of the ways we've responded to that as MEX is by investing in a new methodology based around metered cooking appliances, which means that you then have access to really good data on how much it's actually being utilised, which you can then use against the, the, the carbon credits uh, um, and to, to apply for those carbon credits. Even better than that, because we're dealing with companies that are now utilising pay-as-you-go systems for, for paying for the cost of the electric appliance and so on, we've recently seen a project with uh, our partners in a company called ATEC, where together with the Fair Climate Fund, they've developed a system whereby they're getting carbon credits and they're paying 70% of those carbon credits back to the people that are utilising the, the electric cookstoves in the communities where they're, where they're working. I mean, it's small scale at the moment, but the opportunities of that, so that's to address the points we were talking about earlier about not everyone can afford um, electricity, uh, electric-based cooking at the moment. But this is a massive opportunity to significantly reduce the cost as part of this whole decarbonisation agenda. Yeah, yeah uh, actually, I come to you. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> yeah, is, yeah. Talking about renewable energies, yeah. uh, universal access, carbon finance. Actually, I think there is a point that's uh, worth mentioning. Uh, that's actually mini grids. Yeah. So mini grids as energy uh, community energy systems, uh, actually they've been uh, alluded to be like one of the solutions to achieving universal access. But also, it's been said that uh, 
you know, to achieve financial sustainability of these systems is quite challenging. But when you look at electric cooking, actually it can help or support these systems to be uh, financial viable. And uh, make such, uh, actually is supporting these systems uh, through uh, the challenge funds. Uh, there is one that's going on uh, now. And what we saw is from the reports, the modeling they did is, for example, if you introduce 10% of your customers adopting electric cooking, actually it moves uh, the sustainability or I would say uh, the operations of the mini grid from being non-financial uh, sustainable to, to the viability uh, or sustainability of the mini grid, just 10%. Why? Because most of mini grids actually have a very low uh, load factor, the low demand. But when you add e-cooking, actually it increases that demand. And when you put in, you know, uh, the fact that uh, carbon finance actually can support these people to have access to this uh, electric cooking uh, in terms of affordability. So I think all these uh, programs can actually uh, come together to support these other programs that have been uh, going uh, uh, for some time actually to achieve uh, some of these goals. And, and are mini grids in, in place now or is this, is this something that you're proposing? Where, whereabouts are they? Where would you find them? There are thousands of them across, yes. uh, across um, Asia, Africa, South America. Oh, okay. So they are, they are yeah, in, in large numbers. So yes, and purposely built for for this reason, for for cooking. Or no, for no, 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 no. It's, no. It's, it's largely for sort of electricity access projects. Oh, okay. So it will be things such as the. Um, and would you find them in more rural towns? I presume? Yes, yeah. often in, in in the rural areas. So yes, so so, and so uh, yes, so that's the. Uh, uh, so they'd be around sort of things, so, you know, access to lighting. But then actually, some areas around you know, where people can maybe start to do productive uses of energy, so you might find there'd be some milling machines or some um, solar water pumping or things like that to actually improve um, uh, yeah, the sort of the, the, uh, the business opportunities yeah. as well. But as Jerome was saying, often these, these systems are underutilised, they'll be only maybe used at particular times of the day and so that then they could then be you know, readily available for, for cooking as well. So yeah. The, the other challenge is um, so mini grids are, as you rightly said, they, they, they tend to be in areas where the grid has not arrived and is not going to arrive. Sometimes that doesn't actually ring true. I've been involved in projects where we've been told by the, the local authorities that the grid is not going to arrive. We've developed mini grid projects and then lo and behold, a year later, oh, there's the grid and it outcompetes the mini grid because it's subsidized, et cetera, et cetera. So really important here is something called integrated energy planning. So one of the reasons why in, in Gecko that we've partnered with SE for All, Sustainable Energy for All, is that they have a program where they're working with governments to develop integrated energy planning. And one of the important parts of that is, in most countries at the moment, you have subsidized um, grid electricity, and then you have mini grids that are developed by the private sector that have to meet their capital costs within a very short period of time. So what that then means is that you end up with urban areas and peri-urban areas having access to electricity at a subsidised rate at a certain level of cost per unit. And then you have in more remote areas with people that have far less resources, mm -hmm. they may be paying double, three times, four times, five times the amount per unit. So an integrated energy policy is actually, it, it, I mean, it's, it, it does much more than this, but it allows you the opportunity to think about actually, is there a way of cross subsidising um, the, the, the costs in that kind of a way? Um, and so one of the challenges we faced previously when we've looked at electric cooking or mini grids is this very high cost per unit. So if you're trying to get people to adopt electric cooking in those areas where they're probably collecting fuel for free anyway, then the opportunities for them to cook with electricity will actually be really low, not least because the levels of consumption are so low anyway. So if you can introduce some way of, of massively reducing the, the, the co unit cost, one route is simply by having people consume more, which, which means that you're using more of the capacity of the grid, which means that you can lower the, um, the, the, the cost per unit. Another way is this crop subsidization I'm talking about. This doesn't happen very often, but one country where we're beginning to work where we know that this is happening, which is exciting because it means you've got a much lower cost in these mini grids, is Ghana. So Ghana has 88% 
um, coverage of their grid now, which actually makes the opportunities for cross subsidization subsidization much higher. So we're beginning to work with them on their mini grid program, which is where um, there are lots of opportunities there because generally the mini grids are being proposed for areas where the grid is not going to arrive because maybe they're island communities or whatever it might be. Um, so that means that you're then developing grids with a parity of price with the with the, the grid, which means that in those communities you've got much more opportunity of having the, 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 the price point for electric cooking at a point that's going to be competitive or attractive for people to think, actually, we might spend a bit of money on it here, but it means we're not going to have to get on a boat and go because there's no, there's no um, wood left on this island. So if you want to go and collect wood, you have to go somewhere else. You have to go and collect it. It'll take a long time. Or if you're going to purchase it, it's expensive because they bring it onto the island, similarly with LPG. So actually, those sorts of opportunities are the ones that we're, we're supporting and seeing, seeing really interesting opportunities to look at different models where you're looking at the electricity system as a whole, not looking at clean cooking as something that's entirely independent and kind yeah. of boxed. So once, so, say for instance, you, you manage to get an affordable rate for, for rural communities, there's still, I presume, a challenge to then get them to transition to clean energy. Um, one of the things that we were talking about before was the cultural aspect of it. Um, how, how, how difficult is that to change? You know, you have somebody who's been cooking a certain way for a certain time. Jerome? Actually, as we were saying, uh, all these programs come to fruition if there is political will, and uh, that political will actually comes with uh, awareness campaigns. And uh, these are, you know, one way of making sure that people actually get to know uh, that there is those uh, alternative. Uh, another point is uh, actually uh, through education. Uh, for example, uh, when we were, uh, there was an event actually that UNFP, uh, uh, that's wonderful program, uh, actually was leading, uh, talking about uh, uh, school feeding. And they were saying that actually through schools, you can bring this uh, transition to clean cooking because children or these uh, young children are actually the future and uh, once they know uh, that there are other alternatives they can talk to their parents so I think political will is very important because it touches all these uh, sectors we're talking about schools households but also communication uh, in general so it's not easy because it requires funds, especially when you need to do uh, like uh, nationwide uh, campaigns. But uh, I think it needs to be done so that uh, this knowledge can be uh, given to the population. It, Pete, it was, it was something that was absolutely fascinating. I, I, a couple of months ago, I discovered some promotional materials um, that the, uh, from the UK and from the States uh, from the 1920s and 1930s, when the electricity system was being built in those kinds of contexts. And it was exactly the same kind of issues. Now, obviously, they're massively different contexts. I'm never going to assume that what happens in the West is going to then happen in, in, in Africa uh, 50, 60, 70, 80 years later. However, what was fascinating was that you were getting the development of um, these this new electricity system, and the electricity generating companies obviously wanted to sell their electricity. So what are the obvious ways in which you could utilize high loads of, of electricity? Cooking was a really important part of that. So you've got these adverts and campaigns about cook electric, you know, and, and it all talks about the flexibility, the quickness, the cleanliness. Uh, and the, obviously the main competitor in, 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 the, in the UK was coal. So it's quite similar to the debates about charcoal. In that, in that sense. And obviously there was also the, the, the competition with gas that was emerging and so on. So it's really interesting to go back to some of those campaigns and look at how it was being led. And actually also the massive transition that occurred. Once electricity was made available, the transition to electric cooking was pretty rapid, um, even though there was the competition from, from, from gas at the same time. And the significant amount of, of, of uptake of electricity for cooking in Europe and in the States was was um, very, very rapid over that period. So actually drawing on some of those experiences, you, you can see that, that um, it's something that if it's developed by 
the electricity generators and the companies producing the, the appliances and so on. It's not just something that will be developed by NGOs and so on. So over the last 10 or 15 years, I think the growth of where there has been success in, in clean cooking tends to have been from very small scale uh, companies that have perhaps used carbon finance to develop their, their, their um, uh, um, products and their, and their financial models and so on. But it's kept at local production, local companies within individual parts of a country even rather than even nationwide. What we've seen over recent years is A, the emergence of this whole electric cooking area, but also a significant emergence of, of LPG as a, as, as a fuel and as a strategy over the last kind of 10 or 15 years. And the difference is it's professionalized and it's, and it's big, big levels of investment, big companies. But that also means is that you've got all of the um, resources of those types of organizations that, that can support that, that, that transition, which is in some ways, bad news for these small organizations that have made their, their living out of trying to adopt these, these kind of partial solutions. And they've done some amazing work and really building capacity and so on and so forth. But if we're talking about a scaled solution, you're really looking at these much bigger, much cleaner solutions, ultimately, both in health and in, and in uh, um, carbon terms. So it's, that's the stage where we are at the moment, I think, in terms of the growing international commitment to seeing something happen, a recognition that actually you're seeing the same transition towards the electrification of society, the urbanization of society as well. Um, and that's something that is going to be happening. And it's about supporting it and enabling people, that, that making sure that people don't get left behind as this transition occurs. And obviously it's about how that electricity is generated, the shift towards renewables as part of that and so on. Um, but yeah, it's just an amazing time to be working in this area because there are so many opportunities. One thing I wanted to ask you about is the, um, you've created a cookbook. Is that it's, right? It's not just one. Oh, it's so, not just no. one. So okay. how many is it now, do you reckon? I think it's 12 countries that we have cookbooks in. Yeah, I think. I think it's needs to help, exact needs to help people yeah. with, with the, a new way of cooking with, yeah. so, with so gas. So right from yeah. the start of, of MEX, we, we've looked at what are people currently using uh, to cook with? What kinds of dishes do they cook and how long does it take to cook them and in what types of utensils, all that kind of stuff. Because we knew that actually... Um, it's going to be really complicated and those cultural factors will have a big impact on the uptake of, of whatever different solutions you develop. So one of the things we wanted to do was to, have, was to develop um, a, 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 a resource that would explain the cost benefits from transitioning but also explain uh, how uh, the um, different types of meals that, that uh, are dominant in a particular cuisine, how they can be cooked using ele electric appliances, um, the different ways in which you would need to, to adjust the way in which they're cooked to utilize the appliances and so on. So we now have these cookbooks, um, uh, and I think we maybe have some images of, the, of, of them that we can show, um, uh, that look at, a, take a, maybe four, five, kind of, or even more in some cases, um, recipes, um, go through how you would cook them using an induction stove or electric pressure cooker or whatever or whatever it might be. Um, and also, for a number of them, chart how much it would have cost to cook traditionally to cook using biomass uh, and how much it costs to cook it on loads of different fuels. It, it, it compares LPG, ethanol, um, elect, uh, electric cooking on, on really efficient appliances and electric cooking on, on, a, um, on a basic... Uh, um, coil hob um, and so that I mean that's a tremendous resource and we found that in the countries where we develop these resources they've been really well received we've won some uh, culinary book prizes um, for these things which is quite I never thought as a as a uh, academic researcher that I'd win a cookery book <laughs> yeah. prize my wife is very, is is, um, <laughs> is quite skeptical in terms of the yeah she knows what my cookie's like but yeah. I suppose it's worth mentioning who 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 came up with the recipes um, local it, local cooks Yes, yeah, and local women cooks. And local women cooks, yes, that absolutely. Was the most yes. important fact. Yeah, yeah. These were developed. Yeah. yeah. So these are, for example, the first one of these that we did in Kenya was based with, with uh, actually the, a, a cook that is active on Instagram uh, and is uh, something of a, of a celebrity in Kenya, known for a celebration of traditional Kenyan cook, cooking culture. 
Um, and we came across her because she was doing like videos on YouTube and Instagram and so on about uh, Kenyan cuisine. We went and talked to her and got talking with her, and she's now a massive convert to using electric uh, um, cooking. And um, she helped us to develop the, um, the, the cookbook and continues to work with us. So, for example, one of the programs we're supporting with Kenya Power is we've developed a whole TV series with different local cooks illustrating uh, how you can cook with electricity and save money and, and save time and all those kinds of factors. So it's not just about providing the, the data that Jerome and others work on in, in showing the affordability and so on. It's also about working with... Uh, advocates and yeah. and um, as, as Richard was saying mate you know con converting and convincing people of the opportunities that there are Brilliant. yeah and it's quite interesting when you distribute these uh, booklets actually it's the best way for people to understand how uh, oh, you I can see, cook. Yeah. yeah they Good are quite to, yeah, to the, to the more the than you can yeah, yeah. you know talk about numbers as yeah. you were saying yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. what kind of recipes are there in there I'm quite interested though um, Can you remember? Uh, I'm trying to. Um, I mean, there's, there's some staple dishes like bean dishes and things like yeah, that. Yeah. So especially like some of the, yeah, especially these hard to 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 cook foods. I can remember sort of you know different sorts of, uh, you know, bean dishes and spice dishes and things you'd get. Yeah. So, yeah. And the Indian one, for example, different basic curries and dals and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's and it's so it's and that's if you immediately think about that in Kenya. Quite a lot of the dishes are based on beans and pulses um, or poor quality meat, all of which require a long cooking time. Whereas in other country cultures, where, for example, where stir frying is a, is a major thing, it's a really short thing. Yeah. So fresher cookers are not so much used in those, in those contexts. Whereas in those places where longer cookers is, is, is required, then fresher cookers provide a tremendously important saving in, in, in cost yeah. savings. Excellent. So the things we've been discussing today, is this... Um, localised challenges to anywhere on the planet or is it a global challenge? So one of the reasons why we went for the wording that we did with the new coalition, you know, the Global Electric Cooking Coalition, um, and that's um, because, yes, the most... What's the word? I'm trying to think of the right word to Pressing. use it. Pressing uh, or extreme challenges are for those people that are currently cooking using biomass um, and are therefore really damaging their health and it has a, obviously a major implication for, for, for uh, um, carbon issues, deforestation, everything we've been talking about. However, um, decarbonizing cooking is a challenge for the whole world. So if we're serious about the transition to, to, to net zero by 2050 and the progressive decarbonization of our societies, cooking is something we all do. So it's a, it's, it's a massively significant issue that every country globally needs to adopt and recognise that it's part of this issue. So, for example, if you think about the different types of countries involved, in countries like ours, the UK, we have very high levels of adoption of, of, of clean cooking solutions in the health sense of it. However, we also are using fossil fuels for a significant portion of our, of our cooking. The same is true for, for, for the United States, for many European countries and so on. Other countries we, we, where there is a, a significant but um, uh, important minority that are still using really traditional uh, damaging forms of, 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 of um, cooking fuels. An example of this might be India. Um, where a significant portion are still utilising dung or, for, or, or, um, or wood or whatever it might be. Um, but also, there's this, again, a significant transition towards liquid petroleum gas, LPG, um, and then a whole host of other countries in all sorts of different contexts and circumstances. So I mentioned earlier on this roadmap um, that's been developed, which is trying to match this um, urgency in relation to those with the most damaging use of, 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 um, of dirty fuels with the long-term drive for decarbonisation. How do we make sure that those two things are, are um, working together uh, um, and are part of a long-term transition that sees everybody move towards decarbonised cooking by 2050, at the same time recognising the massive challenge of dealing with those people that have the least access? So um, that's what the Global Electric Cooking Coalition is designed to do, to address that whole complexity and what is the role of electric cooking in driving towards that 2050. So 2050 clean cooking, large part of that will be electricity. I don't think anyone is, 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 is doubtful about, about that. So if that's the case, 
then there are serious questions from my perspective at any rate about strategies that um, put a strong emphasis on LPG as a transition fuel. Um, there are some countries where it already is a significant component, it will continue to be a significant component. But those places where a strategy is put in for significant growth of LPG, for me that's mis misguided because it's, um, it's not going to be part of a long-term strategy. You may be embedding um, continued growth of fossil fuels um, into the strategies of those countries which are then adopting it and so on. So I think if you spent the same amount of resources on uh, developing electric infrastructure and campaigns and targets and subsidies and all those kinds of things, it's a much better use of resources than putting it into LPG. Although having said that, under MEX, we're also looking at ways of decarbonizing LPG. So we've also been putting resources into bio-LPG, biogas, ethanol. So you know we're not, we're not a one-trick pony, but we continue to see electricity as, as probably the most important uh, um, uh, fuel type in terms of yeah. this long-term transition. Okay, so Ed, Ed mentioned um, LPG, liquid petroleum, gas. Is, are there any other alternatives? Uh, we've, there's still potential for looking at um, clean um, cooking with, with bio-resources, and it's in particular is, is biogas. Uh, biogas has been around, uh, been utilised for over 100 years. It's uh, a product of, of what's a process called anaerobic digestion, where you break down organic matter uh, in, a, in a reactor vessel and it produces a mixture of methane and, and carbon dioxide. Uh, it's quite popular in rural parts of India and China, so there's, there's millions of biogas digesters uh, in, in India and tens of millions uh, in, in China. And there's also been uptake uh, in, uh, in other parts of the Global South as well. And so uh, it's, it's the way you produce your, uh, your, your methane and like with, with natural gas, um, it's quite simple, you just need to have a, uh, um, your, your, your gas reactor producing the biogas uh, and then you just need to, uh, just to, you can either store that in the reactor or in the gas bag and then you just need to have a burner and you can cook with it in the same way you'd what cook that, with, with gas. Normally what, you, what we'll go into in terms of the sort of feedstock, so this could be things such as cattle slurry um, or, or agricultural wastes. Um, and food wastes and, and, and things, say, from, from restaurants. Human uh, waste? Human waste can be used as well. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so all sorts of, of potential yeah. uh, feedstocks which could, which could be used uh, for this. Uh, it's a well understood technology, uh, it's, it's generally quite simple. It has issues, I think, in terms of sort of a setting up cost. So, yeah. again, you, you, it has to be sort of at an, a, at an affordable level, but there have been sort of technologies which have been appropriate in Africa, uh, essentially using large um, bags as, as reactor vessels, which are, which are very cheap, and these have been taken up in, in places like Kenya and Tanzania and Zambia, um, where so, uh, and they have you know, very cheap um, uh, solutions. Uh, and and are, the, are, these, are these things that you would use, you would, each household would have a biogas generator or would they? So it's it's scalable. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's oh, the whole, okay. that's, that's the one in, in very interesting things like with, with renewable, all sorts of renewables, it's very scalable. So you can start off with a very small reactor for an individual family. Uh, you can scale it up to larger systems for, uh, for, uh, for communities uh, where may, maybe people would share resources. Um, we've seen examples with an organisation called uh, Mary's Meals in Malawi, where at a school they use the the, the, uh, the children produce the biogas from the from the latrines, uh, and it goes and so they cooks cooks meals uh, from from the, from the, from the toilets uh, to produce the biogas, which is then used for for, for cooking the children's uh, meals for this particular charity. So yeah, and it scale up to larger systems. So for example, uh, examples for example in India where. Um, there's lots of cows in India, and uh, and uh, they don't, uh, they, you know, in some practices they don't like to kill the cows, so they retire the cows after their milking lives, and they go to uh, retirement homes. So you have a cattle retirement home, and there they have biogas being produced in reactors, which then are used to feed communities. So local people, maybe thousands of people, will be fed from from oh. the, from the from the waste in in these kitchens. It's, if you take that to a, 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 a even further stage, is you then have rather than using the biogas for, uh, for cooking, you use it to generate electricity. Yeah. So you then have waste to energy conversion plants at a municipal level or at the level of um, a, uh, a large farm that's producing agricultural residues and that kind of, that kind of thing. And actually, when I was mentioning uh, bio-LPG, 
One of the reasons why BioLPG has become something that's being looked at seriously is the biggest problem for biogas is it's brilliant in rural areas. In urban areas, the difficulty is the distribution systems that, 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 are, that are necessary, and the same in, per, in, per, in peri-urban areas. So what the argument goes is if you can get a big enough uh, program of biogas production going that you can then convert that biogas into biopropane, which then all of the systems are already set up for the distribution of, of, of LPG. So we've done some work on that over recent years. It's something that doesn't look like it's quite commercially viable at the moment, but we're working with a number of different entities to explore whether that it might what's, become viable. What's the, output, what's the energy output like compared to solar or, or something? Uh, it's... it's mm, yeah, it's a good... It's, it's, it's a, I mean, they're different things. That's, you can't, you can't, it's okay. very difficult to compare like with like because you're looking at gas for cooking as, as opposed to sort of electricity for cooking. So, so that mean like the, 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 the set of costs and the running co- and the, the, initial, the initial cost of having a generator yeah. compared to having in, sort of implementing solar panels, would it be more? I think with the biogas systems, um, there's, there's a lot of simplicities involved in them that they are, um, you know, if you're using a gas bag system, they are, you know, they are uh, cheap uh, and cheap to run. Um, there isn't necessarily the time saving aspects because you still do need to feed the system. Yeah. So there will be, there is a time factor, which uh, sometimes we don't necessarily uh, think about. Um, and the advantages are that generally, you know, there's not much can go wrong with them once you set them up. Um, with the, with again, depending on the sort of a scale of systems. With uh, if you're looking at you know large scale electric cooking systems, which you know w- within the grid, then again, it's just an additional appliance onto the onto yeah. the grid, so it's not really a major factor. Um, with with microgrids, I mean, the issue would be. As 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 we mentioned, there's about sort of you know, their sort of the affordability of of the microgrids, and this is why sort of Ed was talking about sort of cross subsidisation of them, and then the maintaining of the systems in in the long term, so that you have sort of some uh, potential long term issues with batteries. Um, solar modules last at least twenty years, maybe longer. Um, batteries may be sort of a, a, an issue of, of how long they get used, and but as long as they're looked after, but this also brings like training yeah, as yeah. well. So in all these circumstances, whatever the systems we would bring in, whether it's um, making people aware of different ways of cooking through the cookbooks, that's a form of training. Yeah. Whether, but then to actually have um, local trained people in the communities uh, who can manage the systems and know how to fix the systems as well. So this could again be great opportunities for training of of, of girls and women in the communities and how to manage uh, the systems um, and yeah so it's it it brings in the sort of making sure there's those that system resilience is there um, so that you can uh, you know make sure these systems last long term and people get excited by by being able to cook cleanly with electric cooking or with gas clean gas cooking and so that they can um, you know feel that oh, this is making a difference to my life my life is so much better now because I can cook quicker cheaper and cleaner. I think it also shows the diversity of circumstances and the different solutions that can occur within those different yeah, circumstances. It's not one size fits all. Exactly. Yeah. And I think for biogas, it works most uh, strongly in communities where there is a strong tradition of cattle rearing or of, 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 of other live, livestock rearing. In that sense, because you have a sufficient number of animals to do it at the scale that you need to to, 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 um, uh, to produce the sufficient levels of biogas, that doesn't work in all countries and contexts and circumstances and situations. So it's very much a matter of targeting where, the, where, where that is something that would work effectively. Um, it's also true that that can be a real potential solution in areas where there isn't a strong tradition of, of mini grids and so on or, or what have you. Although it's interesting that we're beginning to see some uh, use of electric cooking on even individualized solar home systems, which in the certainly even two or three years ago, we as a program were saying was probably not going to work effectively. But we've been supporting a small project in Malawi, um, which is where electric cooking has been introduced alongside irrigation. Um, so it's uh, where there's a good match between utilising the, the system during the, the daytime alongside irrigation. The irrigation is not happening all of the time. So it's, um, and it's something where the money to pay for the system is being developed for the irrigation and the support for the agricultural activities. But one of the benefits is that they're then able to also use the system for electric cooking, which is one of the things that we, the community were really keen on, yeah. so interestingly enough. Okay, wonderful. 
Right, well, thank you, Jerome, Ed and Richard. You. Uh, it's your chance to plug anything you'd like to plug, <laughs> any websites. We'll obviously include the links in, uh, in the description, but anything you'd like to add? Um, what do I want to add? I think, uh, what, what, what things to add here? I guess there's this sort of, yeah, in terms of sort of the work we're doing in developing countries, then um, at Crest, then there's, uh, we have uh, activity in what's called a Renewable Energy for Development Group, uh, and also hydrogen research groups who are looking at uh, potential opportunities for uh, different forms of uh, renewable technologies and also hydrogen in developing countries. I think it's interesting, one of the, the, the real successes at Loughborough, I think, is, is that um, we recognise that most global challenges are um, massively complicated. So therefore, you cannot only approach them from a social science or from an engineering or from a, a natural science perspective. You need to bring people together from across the institution or from indeed globally to, to deal with those kinds of challenges. So I think that's something that the university is, is, is very good at. Um, and they're part of the strategy of the university, actually. One of the three central um, parts of the university strategy is dealing with sustainability and net zero. So this kind of research is absolutely central to what um, the Loughborough University's um, mission is in that, in that sense. Uh, and so this fits absolutely under the, the, the STEER Centre, which is in the social sciences and humanities, but it also fits in, into CREST. And our collaboration, I think, shows that that bringing together is really important. The other thing I'd want to say is um, we're incredibly grateful to UK Aid, uh, the FCDO, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, for um, recognising the importance of this issue in uh, funding the work that we do and supporting the, 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 um, the, the collaborations that, that are central to, to what we do. So we're incredibly grateful to their, them for their financing of the whole programme. Yeah, uh, what I'd add is uh, actually uh, transitioning to clean cooking is actually <coughs> also uh, important in terms of, um, I would say, it may sound uh, very strict, but uh, as like human, uh, hum, uh, human rights. For example, uh, when you look at children actually uh, collecting uh, this firewood every day, and uh, you can imagine to collect firewood for a family to cook, if you are 8, 12 years old, actually you cannot carry that much. So you have to do it like every two, three days. So to do that, every day carrying that amount of uh, uh, firewood on your head uh, over, let's say, uh, six, ten years, it's quite, uh, quite uh, a question of human rights. So I think it's also a call on government actually to think about addressing that, uh, that issue. Thank you for your final thoughts. Um, as I mentioned, links um, to things we've been talking about will be in the description below. Um, and thank you for joining us.